I'm on mute. I'm sorry. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, it's time for our first panel, the past. Uh, but again, we're going to start with our access statement. We strive to be as inclusive as possible. And to that end, here's some information about how the event will go. We have an ASL interpreter, and you can pin her to your screen to uh, make her bigger, uh, as well as manual closed captioning as standard accommodations for the panel. Uh, we will orally identify ourselves, and I'm Matthew Selig, uh, when we are speaking. Uh, when we are speaking for the first time, we will describe our visual appearance. In all instances, we will state our name before we speak. Uh, if a speaker shows a slide, they will describe and explain what is on the slide. We encourage participants to use plain language wherever possible and define acronyms or avoid using them altogether. We have a few channels by which you can ask questions. Anyone may type a question in the Q&A tab, and that's the Q&A tab, not the chat, uh, which we want to reserve for accessibility and tech issues. Um, we will have a moderator read your question, unless um, when you ask the question, you prefer to do so orally. Uh, to ask it orally, please indicate that you would like to ask orally in the body of the question. Or alternatively, you may simply raise your electronic hand. Um, and we're going to try to reserve about the last 30 minutes or so for question and answer. Um, and again, if you're, if you're uh, asking orally, we'll allow you to unmute yourself and, and you may ask the question. Um, finally, uh, you, uh, sorry, we have a phone line uh, where anyone can call in to ask a question. That number is 215-898-7000. You may also use this number to make accommodation requests or report tech issues. And again, you may also use the chat uh, to report those. Uh, we've put the access statement in the chat and it's also available on our website. Um, this uh, panel and, and going forward, CLE is available. So I'm going to introduce Ashlyn to read our CLE information. Hello. Um, if you are seeking CLE credit for today's event, um, please note that the CLE passwords will be announced twice per hour. Write down these passwords and enter them on your digital evaluation form once the event is over. Uh, the evaluation form is mandatory to receive CLE credits. The link to the digital evaluation form was emailed to you in your event reminder email. Um, but if you did not receive this email, please find the link to the evaluation form um, in the chat. I'm gonna post that now. Um, these passwords will let us know how long you attended. So the first password is duck, D-U-C-K. Duck. Thank you. Thank you, Ashlyn. Um, all right. Uh, this panel, again, is the past, and we're taking a look at dis the disability frame from a historical lens. We will hear remarks from Rabia Belt, Nate Holdren, and Karen Tani in that speaking order. Leah Samples will then deliver a short comment and invite questions from the audience. Biographical information about each participant is available uh, in our symposium program, which is um, on the Dropbox that was uh, previously put in the chat and I'll put it in the chat again. I will now give the floor to Professor Belt. Thank you so much, Matthew. And good morning to everyone um, who is participating in this symposium, it's very exciting. My name is Rabia Belt. I'm a professor at Stanford Law School by courtesy of the Stanford History Department. I am a black woman with short curly hair that is not as fabulous as Leticia's hair. And I am wearing a navy shirt with blue and pink flowers on it. I use she, her pronouns. First off, I would like to thank the Penn Law Review organizers, especially Matthew Selig. Um, I hope that you're going to be able to get some well-deserved uh, sleep soon, Matthew and Leticia Salazar. Thank you to Representative Presley for an amazing keynote speech. 
and to Dean Ruger for his support of this symposium, especially bringing the cash. Um, and thank you to my fellow panelists, uh, both today and tomorrow. I've learned so much from so many of you, and I look forward to learning more today and tomorrow and getting to know new people. Um, thank you to Lee in advance for what I know will be great comments for this panel. <laughs> And thank you to Jasmine Harris and Karen Tani for bringing us together here. So for not only producing amazing scholarship, but for transforming um, this institution, oh, excuse me. <coughs> um, and this field uh, to make disability visible. This is long overdue. Usually when I'm in conferences and symposium, I'm thinking, where is disability? But that is definitely not the case today and tomorrow. And it will be a reminder that as disability historian Douglas Bainton told us, disability is everywhere in history once you begin looking for it, but conspicuously absent in the histories we write. So for my presentation, I'll be using disability to think about the shadow side of our democracy. In particular, I'm finishing a book, Disabling Democracy, Mental Incompetency, Citizenship, Suffrage, and the Law from 1819 to 1920 that thinks about how mental incompetency has shaped the development of voting rights. Here, the mental disability frame was used by opponents of subordinated groups to knit them together as people who did not deserve the franchise. And activists from these same groups invoked disability tropes to distinguish themselves in trying to gain uh, political power and rights. So the time period that I look at um, this long 19th century was when nearly every state in the United States disenfranchised people based on mental status. The majority of states still have these laws on the books. So in order to define the able-minded, rational political citizenship citizen, the law had to forge its opposite. And when property ended as a voting prerequisite in the early 1800s, and the mind took its place as a precondition, new questions emerged. Whose minds qualified for the franchise? Was it possible to draw clear distinctions about mental competency or acumen based on race, class, ethnicity, and gender? What evidence indicated an incompetent mind? Could ordinary people determine incompetency or was it just uh, the province of medical experts? Disability was not the term used by my historical actors. Instead, heeding the call of disability historians, I used disability as a social category rather than an individual characteristic. It uncovers the meanings given to human variants, like race, gender, and sexuality, culture constructs disability. And disability frequently does not refer to a specific disabled person's body. Dis disability has often been poorly defined and even less understood. However, the vague indeterminacy of the meaning of disability has not dulled the terms impact and implications or impede its use. So my book appends the traditional story of democratization in the 19th century by focusing on those left behind in the shift from economic dependency to mental incompetency as the basis for disenfranchisement. In 1819, Maine became the first state to target mental status for voting. In 1920, the 19th Amendment removed gender discrimination from voting. In the 100 years between these milestones, states built a regime of rules that reserved voting for able-minded adults. By establishing, by examining a series of historical documents, this book reveals the multiple meanings of what is able-mindedness. 
So although state officials echoed medical terminology when they excluded, quote, lunatics and idiots, um, the offensive historical terms um, out of uh, political citizenship, at the same time, they did not believe that medical experts were necessary to determine who fell into these categories. Citizens would use common sense to block the mentally incompetent people in their localities from voting. Political advocacy also shaped who was considered able-minded. Reformers challenged assumptions, for example, that physical disabilities were evidence of mental weakness. Ultimately, states disenfranchised people with mental disabilities, but they allowed people with physical disabilities to vote. Mental competency also factored heavily into debates about the franchise regarding race and gender. Their alleged mental inferiority meant that Black Americans and women were unfit for suffrage and full political citizenship. Activists for both groups challenged their designation as mentally disabled, as they fought for and eventually won the franchise. Cultural conditions also created different legal conventions. Constitutions and statutes usually did not limit voting status based on old age. However, age became an essential factor. Judges were sympathetic to elderly white men, even when they were, quote, enfeebled by age or had, quote, senile dementia. For example, for instance, even though Henry Clay was described in congressional documents as, quote, very old and decrepit and said to be blind, and, quote, his neighbor, S. Brown Allen, sent his horse and buggy for Clay on every election day, and he was able to vote. State and local officials justified requiring able-mindedness for voting in several ways. Some rationale sounded practical. State actors feared that mentally incompetent voters could be unduly swayed by powerful interests or corrupted by fraudulent election schemes. Local officials worried that the concentrated votes of people residing in institutions would overcome the political wishes of their uninstitutionalized neighbors. Other factors were normative. The ideals of political equality thoroughly knit into early American governance rested uncomfortably next to other beliefs also deeply held about quote unquote natural differences in mental ability, talents and virtue among men. White male elites reinforced restrictions against those considered undesirable and incompetent such as women and African-Americans. Simultaneously, New suffrage laws brought white men of varying talents and economic circumstances together as political equals. The presumptions of mental competency net together an otherwise varied group of white men of different abilities, statuses, and classes. And it also shored up the respectability of the vote. Furthermore, it reassured the white populace and elites alike that the expansion of suffrage to poor and middling white men would not necessarily lead to universal suffrage. Concerns about who qualified for full political citizenship didn't end, just changed form over the 1800s. This new language of incompetency provided a ostensible, so uh, race and sex neutral mechanism for excluding those considered undesirable, even as the 15th and 19th Amendments passage was supposed to provide protection against that kind of discrimination. State constitutions and statutes had neat labels for quote unquote lunacy and idiocy that papered over competing understandings of mental competency created by multiple actors and conflicting agendas. Because the formal law on incompetency so often contradicted the ad hoc chaos of mental status and practice, this book looks at law at every level from the top, the middle and the bottom. It charts elite legal discourse and everyday legal consciousness as Americans grappled with democracy, citizenship, the mind and the vote. They imagined a political community of rational, able-minded voters. 
However, that imagined community overlaid the actual muck of real life, including elections rife with corruption, political gamesmanship, and votes of men with varying mental abilities. In the 20th century, political citizenship eventually became multiracial, multi-ethnic, inclusive of men and women, as well as different socioeconomic classes. But this was paid for with a high price. It deepened the exclusivity of the vote by etching even more starkly the lines around citizenship, citizens disenfranchised because of their purported mental incompetency. And this exclusion is still with us today. Despite the centrality of mental competency to voting, the story that this book tells is easy to miss. It recounts a nationwide story, but not one about the national government. Instead, disenfranchisement unfolded in state and local decisions. Small elections where a few votes can change the result became the proving ground of whether certain voters passed mental muster. Legal disputes took place in small towns, not in the US Supreme Court. Losing candidates challenged election results by claiming that certain men had voted. And election decisions hinged on decisions about these individual men. Was Leroy Pitzer, the South Charleston, Ohio town eccentric, also the town idiot or lunatic? Could John Walsh, the assistant warden of the county cook, Cook County Insane Asylum in Illinois act as the election witness for all the insane asylum residents at the polls. These battles expose fissures in the system of statewide disenfranchisement. Instead of neat periodization, disabling democracy connects voting prohibitions based on mental competency to prolonged and hard fought debates over African Americans and white women's political capacities. Their mental competency was crucial to such debates. But competency was also a malleable, flexible catch all category. It could justify arbitrary exclusions to shore up the sense of the purity of the vote. And the book demonstrates how able mindedness became an essential prerequisite for full political citizenship. At the same time that it brings disability and mental competency to legal history, it also brings legal history to disability studies. And so doing the project recovers the emotive and aesthetic aspects of voting that can be neglected by election law scholars. Disqualifying mentally impaired voters were not just about preventing election corruption. It was also an attempt to purify a messy democratic process and project the idea of an unsullied electorate. Mental disability in the long 19th century threatened disenfranchisement to be sure, but to be labeled a lunatic or idiot also suggested aesthetic unpleasantness, indicated racial spoilage and invited social and cultural scorn. But rather than assuming that disability is a dis degraded status, I showed why people tried to separate themselves from claims they were mentally deficient and what made the label so degrading. To be labeled as mentally disabled meant the loss of political citizenship. One possibility could have been to challenge the linkage between mental status and the vote directly, but this was daunting. Instead, most would-be voters described by mental deficiency did not apply to them. They gained political power and status through distancing from the disability frame. But in so doing, they etched the boundaries of mental competency even more sharply, further isolating people defined as mentally disabled as political pariahs. So I'll stop there. I look forward to our continued discussion of the past. Um, and I um, turn it over to my colleague, uh, Nate Holdren, I believe. Thank you. Thanks, Rabia. Thanks, everybody. I'm Nate Holdren. Um, I use he, his pronouns. I'm a balding white man wearing a black sweater with a red collar and a gray stripe on it. Um, like Rabia, I want to thank everyone who organized the event. Uh, I am personally so excited to be here. 
uh, pandemic life is pretty lonely. And um, this kind of intellectual community is a real lifeline amid all that, um, especially on such important issues as we're as the symposium focuses on and an event full of scholars who I personally admire. So I've written a longer paper for today, which Leah has read. And in my remarks now, uh, I'm going to highlight elements of the longer paper that I hope are most relevant to the event today and most conducive to the conversation. And I made a note here to myself to turn on a stopwatch. So I'm, I keep track of my time. Let me do that. Okay. So. Um, in her introduction today, uh, Professor Tani said that she came to disability late. I was delighted to hear that because I did too. And so I wanted to start by just telling you briefly how I came to the subject matter. So um, in 2010, I was at the Wisconsin Historical Society doing research for my doctoral dissertation. And I found an exchange of letters from 1931 between the Wisconsin Industrial Commission and a business called the Wisconsin River Paper Company. The company's doctor had examined an employee named Clarence Fors and found that Fors had a liver disease. And the doctor, rec <clears throat> the doctor recommended that the company fire Clarence Fors because if he got injured at work, he would have a heart attack, which would make his injury even more expensive under Wisconsin's workers' compensation law. This exchange completely mystified me. Um, I've now realized the reason it mystified me is because I had a set of inaccurate assumptions and I was being confronted with reality that didn't fit into those assumptions. Um, I was troubled by this and I really wanted to understand it. And it didn't fit at all with the dissertation that I was planning to write. I thought this will make a cool footnote at the end. I'll put it away and move on. And after a while, I just couldn't stop thinking about it. So I eventually scrapped the whole dissertation project and made this event, the heart of what I was trying to explain. Um, and so that was my point of entry into what our symposium today calls the disability frame. And it became a big part of the dissertation and later the book. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. For the sake of time today, um, I'm going to greatly compress the backstory of, of why workers' compensation laws came about. I hope it suffices to say, over the 19th century, waged work became increasingly dangerous for a lot of reasons. The best estimate we have is that by the beginning of the 20th century, about 10% of wage earners would permanently lose a body part in the course of their work or permanently lose the use of the body part. Um, there are, this is the the tip of the iceberg for work, workplace injuries. There's a lot of additional injuries as well. Um, these are the most visible and e most easily recorded. And with the number of fatalities that happened, um, approximately every nine minutes in the first decade of the 20th century, um, somebody was killed as a result of their job. So it's an incredibly dangerous economy for working people, for wage earning people, I should say. People affected by these injuries, people who were suffered a disabling injury or the survivors uh, who had a loved one die, uh, had no recourse other than to sue the employer involved, and they tended to lose those lawsuits. Again, I have to compress the story, but there's a series of laws passed that are designed to make it easier for people to win employee injury lawsuits over the late 19th century. And by the, the result is that by the early 20th century, the litigation-based system of employee injury law became very volatile for businesses. From the perspective of an injured employee, it's still not a good system. Injured plaintiff, injury plaintiffs lose a lot um, or they win very small amounts, which are very insufficient for their needs. But from the perspective of businesses, it's very important that some of the time and increasingly so, there are very large wins. So I found some cases where a plaintiff got the equivalent of what in 2022 dollars would be about $350,000. And, so, and that's a very large unbudgeted expense to deal with. A, a second piece of the context here is that the economy in the early 20th century um, was characterized by what were in US history unprecedentedly large businesses, specifically in um, the number of employees they had and in the capital invested in machinery. And with lots and lots of employees, it meant that injury became a relative certainty. So if a given injury, if sorry, if a given industry has an injury rate of 
one worker in a thousand killed every year, a business in that industry who employs a hundred people can go, uh, go 10 years and, and will have a fatal accident at some point over a decade. An enterprise in that same industry that employs 30,000 people can plan that in a normal year, they'll probably have 10 employees die. And so um, with those, the, with a larger employment, with a larger number of employees, the, the injury rate becomes a certainty, not a chance anymore. And that meant that taking a chance in court of a really high payout became increasingly unacceptable. In addition, because these businesses are highly capital intensive with lots of machinery, um, they're very susceptible to um, lost income due to um, production halting. If you have a, a, if you run a landscaping business where people work with push lawnmowers and you stop um, work for a little while, the cost of the lawnmower that's not running is fairly inexpensive. If you have, if you own a steel mill with a blast furnace and you need to shut the furnace down because someone got hurt, um, it's really hard to restart a blast furnace and the cost of idling that very expensive machinery is very high. So those pressures combine to make um, businesses increasingly unhappy with the litigation-based system of employment, of, of employee injury law. Business had, businesses had been fairly content with that previously when it shielded them from costs, but as that shield became unpredictable, um, businesses rapidly began to call for a non-litigation-based system, uh, specifically workers' compensation laws, which were rising outside of the U.S. and other countries. And so as business support for these laws grew, political support grew, and the short story is these become law in the, in the 1910s. The first eight states to pass such laws are in 1910, and by 1920, there are 42 states that have these laws. So it's a rapid um, set of state-by-state -state, uh, legislative changes in the period of about a decade. And I want to stress here that above all, what these laws do is solve the problem of financial disruption to business. These laws do some, some other important work for the victims of employee injury. Um, they reduce the post-injury poverty to some extent, um, but that's not the overriding priority behind the legislation, really. Um, and what these laws do briefly is they guarantee that after injury, a person will get a percentage of their pre-injury wage for the for a limited duration of time when they can't work for wages. And if the time off work is longer than uh, what the statute allows, then the person is just out of luck. So in effect, employers in the early 20th century basically planned that a certain number of employees would die every year. Now, employers often found this regrettable, but it was an acceptable cost of doing business and they didn't know how to operate um, without doing so. So I, I don't wanna this, I don't want to make this cartoonish. They're not villains and top hats and monocles kind of gleefully injuring people. They're kind of stuck. They don't know how to operate without this um, ugly outcome. And um, I think we're seeing a very similar situation right now with COVID. Um, there are a lot of empl employers who are operating in ways that are causing COVID exposure Employers are not generally happy about it, but they don't know how to manage the situation without doing so. So um, that's the context for compensation laws. And these laws don't really account for disabled people. Um, in the language of our symposium, uh, compensation laws, they don't really draw on the disability frame. Um, so specifically, the laws all assume initially that the injured person is impairment free prior to their injury, which is wildly out of touch with reality. As I said to you, 10% of workers lose, lose a body part or lose the use of a body part at work in their working life. A lot of those people go back to work because they don't have any other options. And there's a lot of other injuries that are in inducing other kinds of impairments. There's a lot of poverty. There's a lot of reasons why there are impairments among the working class uh, in this era. But legislators don't account for any of that in writing competition laws. Now, that what happens then is there's a conjunction of the widespread presence of people with physical impairments in waged workplaces, lots of injuries, and laws that don't let those people uh, fit within the law cleanly. And the result then is a series of lawsuits over what happens. Um, what happens when a person, for, for example, what happens if a one-eyed person loses their only eye in work? 
Um, and initially, there's a series of cases that say that the one-eyed person who loses their only eye should be paid the same as a two-eyed person who loses one eye. This is a tremendously discriminatory decision. Over time, there's a series of court cases that hold that the standard for compensation should be the total post-injury condition. So the one-eyed person who loses their only eye gets compensated the same as a two-eyed person who loses both of their eyes. In the language of our symposium, this is courts increasingly taking on aspects of what we, what we call the disability frame. This seems obviously positive to me. It's much more fair to disabled people and it's a good thing. But in context, the result is that it means that people with physical impairments become more expensive for employers if they suffer an injury. And very rapidly in the mid 19 teens, employers start to uh, fire disabled employees and they implement programs of medical surveillance to determine who in their workforce has a disability and who among the applicant pool may have a disability. So that's what happened to Clarence Fuller's. Um, and so, and there are a lot of other people like Clarence Fuller's, it's very widespread. Um, and I, th I think we can see this, I think of this is kind of like an evil twin to the disability frame. So prior to workers comp, employers are relatively indifferent to disability um, and less attentive to it. There are some important forms of employment discrimination prior to workers' comp, which I'll get into. But um, there's this new attention, the, the greater legal adaptation, greater legal adoption of the disability frame fosters this kind of warped disability frame on the part of employers, which harms people with disabilities. And I think that's a, a complicated thing that we, we need to figure out how to unpick. Um, I'm running out of time, but briefly, I want to highlight a couple things that this story uh, tells us. One is that the definition of who counted as disabled changed in this period. So there were conditions, I've used the language of impairment here, there were conditions which were not socially disabling vis-a-vis -vis employment prior to 1910. And they became disabling vis-a-vis -vis employment when employers decided they weren't, were not going to hire people anymore. And they did so in response to financial incentives that were legally structured. Nobody's body changed in this era. Um, the standard for what employers would accept or would, would look for in, in a, someone's body changed. I think that's an important point that underscores the insights of disability studies and disability history, that disability is really a process of disablement and it's socially constructed by institutions. Um, the second thing that happens as a part of this is that the ramifications of being counted as disabled changed. As I said previously, there was discrimination against people with disabilities. Sarah, Sarah Rose, the historian Sarah Rose has a great book called No Right to Be Idle, which has a lot on this. I touch on this somewhat in my book as well. Prior to workers' comp, there would be often employment of people with physical impairments at a discriminatory pay rate. So you, you get, you have one hand, you get half as much money, things like that. That's oppressive and in terrible injustice. What happens with workers' comp is there's a reorganization of oppression and injustice toward um, simple, straightforward exclusion. So rather than being able to work for half of the wage, you're not able to have a wage at all. Now, these are two terrible choices and I don't wanna praise either one, but I wanna just call attention to that transition. Um, and I think that where, what I've been doing since the book is trying to generalize further based on this analysis and to press here and what I'd like to, in my brief few minutes left, talk about this in relation to an analysis of capitalism. To my mind, um, what happens here is fundamentally the result of the fact that in a capitalist society, you can't have a good life unless you can afford to pay for it. Um, uh, Beatrice Adler Bolton said this recently in a, a fantastic uh, piece that she wrote on the internet. Says, in, in capitalist society, you're entitled to the survival you can buy and nothing more. And if you don't have money, you can't buy survival. And we see this um, all over the place. And I think this is a fundamental social problem that movements for disability justice will run up against. Um, and the issue is that in a capitalist society, goods and services are produced for, generally speaking, uh, the profit that accrues to the person who sells them rather than the beneficial uh, nature of the product, let alone the needs of people who need those goods and services. 
Um, and I, I think that that explains why we see recurrent disadvantages uh, heaped onto people who are disabled, um, because dis disability often bars people from access to money. Um, institutions treat people as disabled. Institutions disable people from access to money, and then a host host of consequences follow from that lack of access to money. Um, and there's a, a lot of facets of this. I'm I'm wearing glasses. I, I can't see at all um, without glasses. I would be in a different social context, a disabled person, because of my this the sight the condition that my eyes are in. Uh, but with corrective lenses, I I have full social participation. I'm able to afford these kinds of lenses. Were I to live in another part of the world in a different social class, I would be fully disabled. Um, and so the the my ability to have social participation is predicated on my ability to have the money to get these corrective lenses and to live in a social context where the impairment that I have is not disabling. My brother-in-law is in a similar situation with a wheelchair. There's also issues about the built environment in terms of um, issues like how wide door frames are and so on. There's also issues around with, with the pandemic, particularly with exposure to disease in the workplace, which especially harms immunocompromised people and so on. So there's a access to an individual good and there's also access to social collective goods, all of which are deeply shaped by the imperative to profit. I wanna stress, this isn't a matter of greed. This is a matter of pressure. So uh, a workplace that doesn't profit won't stay in business for very long and its employees won't keep their jobs. So this isn't the sort of the, the hearts and minds of, of, of bosses, again, not a villain in top hat kind of story. This is a problem of fundamental social structure, regardless of how good people are or not. And I think that's a real issue that um, is, is in tandem with the disability frame. Um, Marta Russell's got some good work on this. I'm, I'm trying to think this through myself, um, not to compare myself to Marta Russell, but I'm, I'm trying to do the reading and play catch up. I'm going to conclude in just a minute, but I want to, I want to just do so with a nod toward Representative Presley's keynote. I was so delighted by some of her remarks. Um, as she said, pre-pandemic, Injustices were rampant in our society, harming a great many people in deep ways, and the pandemic is only worsening these patterns. As she said, that means the civil rights movement is not over. And as she stressed, the real power is with people, and Congress doesn't lead so much as follow. I was delighted to hear her say that. In my view, the broad picture that I've sketched here means that people who care about justice for disabled people should really prioritize large scale collective action that disrupts business as usual. Now, the, the imperatives to profit that I was talking about and the need to have money in order to have social goods, these are deeply woven patterns in our society and they set limits on the degree to which formal institutions like courts and legislatures can produce justice for people. I think movements for justice can force the issue and impose costs on people who those institutions may not be willing or able to impose costs on, and in doing so, these disruptive movements create space for meaningful action within those formal institutions. So finally, I would say those of us committed to justice for people with disabilities should look to the many examples of socially disruptive direct action that we find in the histories of the most militant wings of the movements for justice for disabled people, movements for justice for racialized minorities, marginalized, people with marginalized sexual and gender identities, and the labor movement. And the final thing, and I'll shut up, I wanna just echo Representative Presley, I love that she said this, that all of those movements, the labor movement, the civil rights movement, the GLBT movement, so on, those intersect with people with disabilities and with the disabled rights movement. There are disabled people in all of those movements. They're not really that distinct. So um, the final thing I'll say to quote the famous uh, labor lawyer and civil rights lawyer, Stoughton Lind, we should view the law as a shield, not a sword. And the role for legal advocacy should be to defend troublemakers uh, above all. So that's where I'll stop. Thank you for your time. Hi, hello again. I'll reintroduce myself. I'm Karen Tani. I am an Asian American woman with short black hair. I'm wearing a black blouse and an eggplant colored blazer. And I am very delighted to be on this panel with um, colleagues that I've learned so much from. So um, thank you to them. My presentation uh, is titled Disability Benefits as Poverty Law, Revisiting the Disabled State. That term disabled state, that's a quote. It comes from political scientist, Deborah Stone. In 1984, she wrote a book about the rise of disability-based social support programs in the US and Europe. 
she argued that policymakers had turned to the concept of disability to quote, resolve the issue of distributive justice. Increasingly, she said, they were using disability to separate the truly needy from the non-needy. Stone also noticed how readily the boundaries of disability expanded, and she predicted that this would not end well. Stone wrote that book around the same time as the court case I'm going to talk about. That case is called Zebley versus Sullivan, Z-E-B-L-E-Y versus Sullivan. It was filed in 1983. I'm sure some people in the audience know it. Uh, when the Supreme Court passed judgment on the case in 1990, it was a stunning victory for legal services lawyers that represented um, the plaintiffs. And it was a big defeat for the Social Security Administration. The decision was also very significant for disabled children and their families. So the decision made it easier for children to qualify for supplemental security income, which often meant uh, automatic eligibility for Medicaid. This was before the creation of the Children's Health Insurance Program, so the health coverage piece was a big deal. And recall that this was at a time when other welfare state programs were under assault. So it was not as if poor families had a robust social safety net beneath them. Before I talk about the litigation, I'll briefly explain supplemental security income. I'm going to use the acronym SSI. I know not everyone in the group needs this, but uh, just, uh, just a brief explainer. So SSI is a means-tested income support program for certain categories of people. It originated as a consolidation and federalization of three previous programs, programs aimed at the elderly, the blind and uh, the quote, permanently and totally disabled. Historically, those categories had a close relationship to work. Policymakers viewed people in these categories as essentially exempt from the obligation of working and therefore worthy of government aid if they needed it. These programs get rolled together in 1972 to become the SSI program. And in doing that inability to work is still the unifying theme. Now, because of how SSI came to be, most people imagined that the program's beneficiaries would be adults. So when people thought about poor children, they tended to think about a different program. That program is called Aid to Families with Dependent Children. Some people just simply called it welfare. Um, and that program really dominated the frame when we're thinking about children. But the SSI program technically did include children, uh, thanks to an enterprising civil servant named Tom Joe. I love talking about bureaucrats, and, and he's, he's one of these characters. He was undersecretary of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. And and as such, he had access to, uh, to the relevant House Committee for this legislation. And as he has told the story, he more or less slipped children into the draft legislation. I won't speculate too much about his motivations, but I'll note that he um, had a disability. He had impaired vision and had previously worked as a legislative aide in California under then Governor Ronald Reagan, who, of course, is no fan of the welfare state at that time. So when Joe moved to Washington, D.C., he knew something about how to protect protect and expand the welfare state under hostile circumstances. And that's basically what he did here. So when the SSI program went into effect, the governing statute actually said that a child claimant could be recognized, should be recognized as sufficiently disabled if the child's medical impairment was comparable in severity to that of a qualifying adult. So shifting back to the Zebley case, um, the named plaintiff was a child named Brian Zebley. He had received SSI for a few years and then abruptly the government cut him off. He was five at the time and had significant vision and muscle skeletal impairments, as well as developmental delays interfering with, uh, with functions like speech and movement and, and toileting. So why would he get kicked off the roll? So for context, this was, Ronald Reagan is now president and he has uh, instituted something that people remember as the Reagan reviews. So this was basically a bureaucratic purge of federal disability programs in the early 1980s. So at the time, it wasn't easy to find a lawyer who specialized in SSI, but Zebley's family did know a local legal aid lawyer, and that lawyer connected the family to a bigger legal aid outfit in the Philadelphia area, Community Legal Services. I'm getting now to how this litigation fits with our symposium theme about disability and about framing choices. 
So the lawyers that staffed community legal services were part of an emerging field of practice that we now call poverty law. They were mentored by people like Ed Sparer, sometimes called the poverty law guru, and uh, by a man named Gary Bellow. They cut their teeth on major welfare rights cases. And in general, their goal was to use litigation to make the social welfare system more generous, more inclusive, and more fair. In terms of their familiarity with disability, it wasn't a specialty. So they had done some work on deinstitutionalization and educational access, but again, disability was not really their thing. So they saw Brian Zebley's case through a poverty law lens. When they filed the case, they framed it in a way that they hoped would benefit Brian, their client, um, but they also hoped that they could expand the government's working definition of disability and therefore help achieve their larger goal, which was to provide more poor families with economic support. So in other words, they recognized that disability was an access point to government support, the kind of support that they thought all needy citizens deserved, and they sought to widen that access point. As an aside, other legal aid lawyers elsewhere in the country were doing the same thing in the context of poor drug users, for example, people with alcoholism, uh, people with under-recognized forms of mental illness, all trying to get the government to place these people under the disability umbrella. So back to Zebley, um, the lawyer's legal argument began with a recognition of the multiple routes that adult SSI claimants had to establish disability. So to get a little bit technical, I'll, I'll try to be simple here. Um, so one route was to have a diagnosed impairment that matched something on the government's official list. The second route involved combining the diagnosed impairment with an assessment of functional capacity as it pertained to work. So when a reviewer took into account functional capacity, as well as age, education, and work history, the reviewer could conclude that the claimant could not work in the national economy and therefore was disabled for purposes of receiving SSI. So at the time of the Zebley case, that second functionality focused route was not available for children. So that was really what the lawyers made the core issue. Now, in an era when children were not expected to work, this approach had some logic, right? To assess a child's ability to work might seem nonsensical. Um, but with only a single route to establishing disability, the result was that the agency was excluding children who seemed obviously and significantly disabled, like Brian Zebley. So his legal team contested this exclusion and eventually they prevailed. They lost at the district court level, but won on appeal and they won again before the Supreme Court. The result was that the Social Security Administration had to rewrite its regulations and provide back payments to all the kids that it had illegally excluded. There is more to say about the litigation, uh, but for now I'll emphasize two points uh, before moving on to talk about the decision significance. So one point is about all the people and organizations that Zebley's lawyers got to support their cause. And the lawyers think that this was very significant. Because they didn't think that the case law was on their side, they focused on recruiting people to file what we call friend of the court briefs on their behalf. And in doing so, they actually educated a lot of organizations about the SSI kids program. I won't name all the groups, but there was a big range from disease specific groups to medical associations to child welfare organizations. Uh, Zebley's lawyers even got the anti-abortion activist James Bopp Jr. to file a brief tapping into his concerns about the devaluation of disabled children. Uh, again, many of these groups didn't know anything about the SSI kids program before the litigation, but they happily joined the cause. The second point I wanna make is that at the Supreme Court level, this case did not generate fierce debate, even though it meant overriding an agency's handiwork and triggering major government spending. The case was seven to two in favor of Zebley and the dissents, the two dissents were very mild. So going back to Deborah Stone and her argument in the disabled state, I think this affirms her, her insight about the appeal of disability as a distribu distributional device at this moment. Everyone seemed to agree that disability was an appropriate basis for receiving government aid, and no one seemed all that upset about expanding who counted as, as disabled, at least not at first. Uh, as I said, as a result of this decision, the government changed its eligibility determination process. So children who did not qualify under the formal listings, that's kind of the more rigid approach, 
approach could now argue that they were functionally disabled. And importantly, this functional assessment was not grounded in ability to work, right? Because again, that wouldn't make sense. It's not grounded in the ability to do work-like things. Rather, it focused on the child's ability to achieve developmental milestones and to function in the kinds of settings where children grow and learn. In 1989, the year before the court decided Zebley, this just goes to the significance, so that prior year, 264,000 children were receiving SSI. By 1996, so that's six years after Zebley, that number was close to, closer to a million. Now, not all of this growth was due to Zebley. Some of it derived um, from a liberalized approach to mental impairments, but experts agree that Zebley was a big factor. Uh, and recall, again, that this kind of understates it because Medicaid is maybe the bigger issue, right? SSI was usually a direct route to Medicaid. The overall population on SSI was never large in the big scheme of things, but having access to this program was a huge deal for low-income families. The longer version of this uh, paper that, um, that Leah Samples has read and, and may mention, um, the longer version covers the backlash then against the SSI kids program after Zebley. So within a few years, parents, um, especially mothers predictably, were accused of using their kids to get, quote, crazy checks. Uh, journalists and politicians implied that children were getting government payouts for just plain old behavioral problems stemming from bad parents and poor life choices. A lot of this rhetoric was racialized. Um, this goes back to um, Representative Presley's comment about the hyper visibility of um, being black and disabled. And as a result of this bad publicity, Congress eventually made the SSI kids program more restrictive. So this was via the infamous 1996 Welfare Reform Act. Um, but Congress did not eradicate the functional route to, to, to eligibility that, that Zebley fought so hard to get. Today, the SSI kids program covers about 1.2 million children and could cover more if every child who met the eligibility criteria actually received benefits. OK, so what should we make of this history? From a pragmatic perspective, uh, I think the SSI Kids Program absolutely was a path towards inclusion. Pro by providing the bare means of survival, this program increased the chances that vulnerable children would thrive. The insistence on a functional assessment for kids also subtly pulled the SSI program away from its touchstone, the labor requirements of the capitalist economy. This is something that Nate Holdren also mentioned. So the idea here, I think, is that Deservingness doesn't need to be tethered so closely to work specific impairments. So in that way, I think the Zebley story underscores the emancipatory possibilities of what Deborah Stone provocatively labeled the disabled state. When we're talking about social benefits, yes, disability has traditionally been defined with reference to what the formal labor market wants, but maybe it doesn't have to be. At the same time though, this history reminds us of two concerns that the disability community has long voiced. So first, the SSI program has always embraced medicalized understandings of disability and empowered medical gatekeepers. This reinforces the view that people who claim disability are inexpert and untrustworthy. The existence of these medical gatekeepers also perpetuates the notion that only a fraction of people who claim disability are actually medically worthy. Uh, second, the expansion of SSI, even incrementally, has reinforced the public impression that to have a disability is to be favored because it appears to unlock state-created privileges that non-disabled people struggle to obtain. For many people, disability has in fact correlated with hardship and exclusion, which is why we have anti-discrimination laws. But unfortunately, the link between disability and cash benefits at a time of supposed austerity reinforces the notion that all efforts to address disability-based exclusion are basically government subsidies, right? A very harmful notion. Ultimately, then, the Zebley story, I think, is one of triumph and tragedy, and I'm still uh, thinking through this and, and would love to hear your thoughts. I think it was a triumph for poverty lawyers and their clients who, under hostile circumstances, pressed for a more generous and life-affirming social welfare system. But I think there is some tragedy in the fact that the best route to subsistence for so many children subjects them to medical gatekeeping and suspicion and surveillance. So I'll stop here and look forward to remarks from our commentator, Leah Samples. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Uh, my name is Leah Samples, uh, she, her, hers. I am a disabled white woman with dark brown hair and I'm wearing a light gray sweater. I'll try to keep my remarks um, brief so we can have uh, plenty of time for questions. And I ask that you ask your question um, if, you, if you can in the Q&A box. Um, and if your question is directed toward a particular um, presenter, please designate that as well.
Tani Holdren and Belt detail three fascinating and distinct instances of what happens when a controversy or problem from early 20th century workplace injuries to late 19th century voting rights to social welfare benefits during the Reagan era are framed in disability terms. We not only see how the employment of disability as a frame is historically situated and changes over time, but also the power that categorizing a certain body mind as disabled has had historically and continues to have today. We see how it created precarity for some by relegating them to the fringes of the labor market, how it created opportunities for others who had formerly been denied benefits by having them reinstated, to the way disability has been used to disenfranchise voters, especially those with mental disabilities. I first turned to Tani's paper, which effectively used the Zebley versus Sullivan case to show how legal aid lawyers managed to significantly expand the welfare state under a Reagan presidency through the employment of a disability frame. Indeed, they sought and won a broader legal interpretation of who counted as disabled, which in turn legally entitled more children to government income support. But really this leaves us with a question of why. Why was disability as a concept and frame so productive? Why is it so flexible? Why were disabled children deemed the quote unquote deserving poor? Was disability here viewed as a legitimate criteria because these children's futures namely their future ability to function and then a separate issue work independently was seen as foreclosed. Does the federal government always expect any body mind that falls into the disabled category to have always already failed to reference um, anthropologist Lisa Stevenson's phrase to be a full citizen, especially because that full citizenship often hinges on one's future ability to become a wage earner. And only yeah, then yeah. does one, yeah. I, I apologize, could you slow down a touch? We're, we're having a tough time keeping up on the, uh... Uh, yeah. Uh, interpreting and transcribing. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and only then does one become deserving of social welfare benefits. Now I'm going to turn to Holdren's paper. Um, and yet this message that disability means inability to work and that only inability to work proves true disability is itself a historical construct, one which Holdren addresses in his paper, Disability and Capitalism in the Aftermath of Workers' Compensation Laws. Whereas Tani focused on the ways in which the employment of a disability frame provided opportunities for disabled people to receive social benefits, Holdren shows us how employers relied on an expanded notion of disability by our workers' compensation laws to push more and more people out of the formal labor market. In this case, a more capacious use of disability as a concept redefined employees' body minds that had not considered themselves disabled prior to this. Not only does Holdren demonstrate how the employment of a disability frame came at a cost of employment, and in many ways, one could argue full economic citizenship, but Holdren also raises larger questions about power, disability, and capitalism, and the violence that came with an expanded notion of disability in the early 20th century. And here, I think it would be interesting for our commentators um, to think more about the intersection of violence and the disability frame. Indeed, Holdren argues that we should in many ways expect capitalism to give rise to disability and that we should keep in mind that law and legislation have a limited capacity to mitigate the social processes that produce disability. This claim brings us back around to Tani's paper where indeed an expanded notion of disability did enable more people to receive social welfare benefits, but it did not in fact erase the stigma associated or the exclusion from the formal labor market that frequently came with the acceptance of those benefits, a bind that many disabled people um, repeatedly have found themselves in over the course of the last hundred years. And I think finally, this can bring us to a larger conversation about the relationship between the disability frame, belonging and various forms of citizenship, which enables us to squarely put all three of these papers into a broader conversation. Belt's paper, for example, addresses one form of citizenship via voting rights, and what it, mean, what it meant to be a rational political citizen. Her paper explored the 19th century legal ch changes that disenfranchised people with mental disabilities for the first time in American history. Her study illuminated the complex and long history of discrimination against those in this group that has a tendency to get neglected even within the disability community, which Tani also highlighted um, regarding learning disabilities and conduct disorders. Here, the legal concept of disability not only disenfranchises people with mental disabilities, but it also enabled other marginalized groups to use the legal concept of disability as a tool to highlight their superior ability or elevated citizenship status. Indeed, because both disability and citizenship are dynamic and historically situated concepts, these three papers from three different time periods in history enable us to think about what is the relationship 
between the legal constructedness of disability and citizenship. Taken together, these three papers speak really to the heart of this symposium, namely how the legal concept of disability is employed and the consequences and opportunities that emerge when people choose to frame a problem or controversy in disability terms. And while we know that disability is not only a legal concept, but also a social construct, lived reality, and for many individuals a chosen identity, I would, be very, I would very much be interested to hear these panelists talk about how in each of their projects, the lived reality of their actors that were deemed disabled came up against, overlapped, or intersected with the disability frame as a, as a legal construct. Um, so hopefully these um, brief comments enable us to at least start this conversation. Um, I want to now turn to a few questions from the audience um, to further talk. So, Excuse me, uh, before we uh, go to questions, I believe it is time for our next CLE code. Okay. Ashlyn, uh, could you uh, read the next CLE code? This is Matthew Seeley, by the way, sorry. Yes, hi. Um, so again, if you're seeking CLE credit for today's event, um, please note the CLE passwords will be announced twice per hour. Um, write down these passwords and enter them on your digital evaluation form once the event is over. The evaluation form is mandatory to receive CLE credits. Um, again, the digital evaluation form was posted in the chat, um, but I can post it again. Um, if you do not receive, um, sorry, these passwords will tell us how long you attended the event, so make sure you write them down. The second password for this event is FISH, F-I-S-H, FISH. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have about um, 25 minutes or so um, for questions. So I'll start. Uh, the first question was for Nate, but I think that the question um, could be extrapolated to any of our panelists. Um, and the question comes from Natalie Chen from the CUNY School of Law. And the question is, what role did you see uh, of race and disability in your historical research on workers' compensation? But again, I think this question could, could apply um, to any of the papers. So, but Nate, if you want to um, start us off. Thank you. Uh, this is Nate, by the way. Um, thank you, Leah, and thank you, Nat thank you, Leah, for the great comment. Uh, appreciate it. And thank you, Natalie, for the question. Um, briefly, this is a limitation in my book that I would like to deal with in future work. Workers' comp leaves out the vast majority of African Americans because it doesn't cover agricultural and domestic workers. So there's a process of racialization in place <clears throat> prior to the law. Um, and so that's one limitation. Uh, that, so that's one way that race operates. And I think my work on this could be better so far. Um, another facet is that the labor market is um, taken as the anchor for compensation payments. And the labor market in the early 20th century is explicitly racist and it's explicitly sexist and explicitly ableist. So there are straightforward, fully legal policies where employers say, well, we pay the white man a buck and we pay the black man a quarter for the same work. And workers comp is doesn't make judgments on what happens in labor markets. So a person, so a, a white worker and a black worker in that kind of environment um, both get hurt, suffer the same injury, the, the black worker's hand is going to be valued at a quarter of the, the white worker's hand. So, so in a way, um, it's, a, it's a kind of early example of what we would now call colorblind racism. And so it means that uh, racialized populations disabilities are just not valued equally to uh, racialized minority populations, white people are a race as well. Um, but so, so that 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 I think is also a significant factor. The, the other thing I would say is that, um, you know, in general, we live in a pyramid shaped society and consequences concentrate downward. All things being equal, racialized populations are pushed lower on the food chain, lower on the, the pyramid. And so con consequences concentrate downward. So people of color, all things being equal, are more likely to uh, face disabilities and so on. And so we're more likely to find these laws don't work for them. Um, but there's a lot more work to be said on that. There's a lot more work that I think needs to be done on particularly the racial dimensions of, of workers' comp and its operations and in the passage. And um, I hope someone does it. If no one else does, I may eventually. But I think that's really an important question. Thank you for that. Thank you. 
This is Rabia. Great. Thank you. Um, thanks, Leah, for your great um, comments. And Natalie, uh, hi, Natalie. So thank you for your question. So OK, so there's a lot of different ways. I think race and gender are important parts of the story that I'm trying to tell. One thing is that when it came to restrictions based on mental competency, as I said, um, so my brief comments is that they were useful because they were malleable, but also on their face, they seemed to be race and gender neutral. So when we did have the implementation of the 15th and 19th Amendment, which restricted uh, um, on the basis of race and sex sort of discrimination and voting, you can do things that seem like literacy tests um, that don't have race and gender written into the law, but were used to have discriminatory effects, right? So, and then there's also, I think, mental competency became a way to sharpen arguments to become included or excluded. So people used it as a way to say that, yes, I am part of the political community, even though, for example, I wasn't able to read, but I was not considered to be intellectually disabled. So I'm in. Um, and those other folks are out, right? So there's always like people who are being excluded as a result of that. And then we had these big two social movements. A big part of it was, with respect to voting. Um, and to say that um, the idea of mental incompetency having a racial, racial or gender metric right to it was a big part of their argument. So with white women suffragists or with black uh, voting rights act activists to say that, no, we are not part of this category of those who are rightfully mentally excluded um, was also part of it. So my group, right, my group of interest ends up becoming the pariah group because everyone else is saying not it. Um, there's also, I think, this, this issue, which I've been playing with that I have to figure out what to do with. And Nate, I'm totally going to corral you for um, a panel on this at some point is <laughs> like what to do about whiteness, um, because I think that one big part of this is disability has been a really um, useful way to discipline the category of whiteness. Um, and um, yes, whiteness has been um, a space of racial privilege, but it can also be a space in which there's a lot of state attention and social attention if you're not considered to be good enough, right, for whiteness or uh, folks that are um, really causing, quote unquote, white decline. And I think those technologies to manage uh, sort of that white decline, they get outsourced um, to folks of color. So we see eugenics moving from Carrie Buck right, um, to moving to, say, attempts to sterilize the women of Puerto Rico, women on uh, Native uh, reservations, women on welfare. I think the same thing in some ways is sort of happening with voting, right, sort of concerns about sort of like, what about these white men who might be quote, not quote unquote mentally up to snuff, right, that might be voters. And then it becomes, well, even if you're Frederick Douglass, you aren't able to vote um, because of this categorical exception. Sorry, like one last thing I think I wanna say is a methodological and scholarship point is that disability is the new kid on the block when it comes to scholarship. And I've been really indebted with what scholars and AFAM history, Native history, um, women's history, gender history have shown us to read sources against the grain, to look for the voices of folks who have been subordinated and disempowered. And I think um, sort of as disability historians, we grow out of uh, those folks that have uh, sort of walked that pathway. Thanks. I'll say a, a, a 
quick few things. This is Karen Tani speaking again. I want to first really thank uh, Natalie Chin for the question and lift up uh, Natalie's own great work in this area. So just thinking about people who are um, taking an intersectional approach to these issues and um, really asking really good questions about how we want to think about race and, and disability and gender kind of all in the same frame. So go look up Natalie Chin's work, <laughs> um, you know, for some for some great thoughts on this. Um, I'll say just about the way that um, that race intersects with my um, paper. I think to go back quickly to that program that I mentioned as being the classic like children's welfare program, and that was the Aid to Families with Dependent Children program. By the early 1970s, that program is thoroughly racialized non-white. It's, it's considered a program, right, for Black for black women and, and has many negative associations attached with it. And I think that in the, the, the years that I'm writing about with the Zebley litigation, the SSI kids program does not have those associations. So the way that it's talked about in the litigation and before the Supreme Court, it's either non-raced or raced by default white is my reading of the sources, but something that happens post Zebley. So imagine now um, people getting back payments, right? That, that were legally entitled according to the Supreme Court to get these benefits. Now imagine people getting thousands of dollars in back payments and now add to this the Social Security Administration's own rules requiring people to spend down their assets. So you have people spending money very, very quickly and you have communities noticing this. And especially if these people, right, were non-white, I think for some people in the community, some of the earliest stories that were raising, that were up in arms about the SSI kids program, I think really are in this context of community members surveilling others and thinking you must not be entitled to what you're getting. And further, right, this sort of threatens my own white privilege because, you know, you're a non-white person who suddenly has a whole lot of cash, right? So I think that there is something that happens um, racially, that there's a, a racial coding that I think happens post Zebly that contributes directly then to the um, to the backlash. But I'm definitely going to think more about that question as a, as a larger through line through the work, and I'm really grateful for it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Karen. Um, this person said they really enjoyed the panel and wondered if you could please talk more about the attitudes of the legal aid lawyers in Zebly towards disability. And how would it differ from disability rights advocates who are more attuned to the interest and politics of disability rights justice movements today? Yeah, thank you for that question. I So I had the good fortune to interview a number of the lawyers who were directly involved in the litigation. And I think they were alert to some of the issues that we might today call more like disability rights issues, access issues, civil rights issues. And as I said, they were alert to deinstitutionalization. So issues that we might call like disability civil liberties issues. But I think their, their frame really was a poverty law frame. And I think that they were thinking about these cases in that frame. And, that, and although they had allies in the disability rights community, those folks weren't necessarily in-house. So I wanna be careful to not sort of, um, you know, criticize their intentions because I think with own, within their own frame, they were pursuing justice as they understood it and absolutely getting economic security for their clients. But I do think there are some important questions that we might just ask as a sort of like counterfactual or imaginary. We could ask what, what, what would the difference have been, right? If people um, were at the table and kind of having a strategic conversation together. And then I think there's a, there's a historical question that historians need to answer about why wasn't that happening, right? Like why were there um, apparently some silos here with people really not um, kind of maybe as regularly in conversation as, as we might hope. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Uh, this is another question um, for Karen. So the next question is, does the segmentation of disability by type and age of onset create institutional discrimination as they receive quote unquote basket, baskets of services despite disabilities spanning age and type? So for example, um, why isn't dementia treated as a developmental disability? I might, with all due respect, kick this over to Rabia Belt, who actually teaches in this area and knows much more about the um, present day workings of disability law than I do. Rabia, do you mind taking this one? Uh, can you repeat the beginning of the question? So it's in terms of 
the importance of age, and this is Rabia, as a category of analysis? Yeah, so the question is, does the segmentation of disability by type and age of onset create institutional discrimination as they receive quote unquote baskets of services despite disability spanning both age and type? Um, the, the short answer is yes, right? Um, so there are a few things happening. One is that we tend to treat children and so minor children and adults uh, very differently. So Karen's work, <laughs> Karen, <laughs> it sort of illustrates um, thinking about uh, sort of those issues. But I think as disability scholars and advocates have been emphasizing um, some of the aspects of thinking about minor children or how we have been typically more generous, for example, sort of with children doesn't necessarily end at the age of 18, right? So in terms of thinking about, say, care work or educational supports or where people sort of live. Um, so I think that that is something as we see, for example, the movement out of, um, um, sorry, 14C exemptions with the Fair Labor Standards Act where we have sheltered workshops. Like this is something that comes to a head, right? Where um, we have had disabled folks who have been in these workshops that are exempt from minimum wage standards um, for their work. Um, one of the things that's been hard in terms of closing these places is that they can be used for care relief. Right, so that family members use them essentially as places to put their adult children or sort of adult loved ones, um, because we don't have a lot of other places uh, for people to receive sort of that space. Um, so it could be some type of respite. There's also concerns about what uh, sort of folks will do, right, if they are closed um, and educating um, parents, for example, about what alternatives are has been really an important part of the work. Um, there's also been sort of tension, I think, between um, traditionally like elder advocates and disability advocates. Part of it is, I think, this collapsing of what uh, being older means, right? So that, um, aging means uh, disability. So there has been, I guess, to go back to my work <laughs> is that um, to say, no, we are not, right? So here are the things that we can do. Um, there's a way to have this conversation in which everyone joins forces together um, as opposed to having it as like a point of tension, but trying to get out of like this, this stereotyped assumptions of like, perceived um, functioning and impairment has been ways to like people are, advocates have not been uh, moving together, but instead have been moving separately. Thank you. So the next question is uh, for all the panelists, and I guess we could start um, with Nate and then um, move between the panelists. Uh, the question is, could the panelists speak to the intersection between the disability frames and the respective historical context they explored in the history of the development of the disability identity? So I think the question is um, sort of speaking to disability frames in the historical context and then perhaps how that intersects with disability identity. Sure thing, happy to. So um, I should say at the outset, my, my work is more a history of awful things that from above that people below are subjected to. And so um, the way I get to come into this is more like um, the identities that people find imposed upon them and then have to respond to, which is different from a kind of um, bottom up perspective on how people identify themselves. I think the two approaches are both very important, um, but I, I wanna just be, be upfront about the limitations of my own stuff on this. So that said, one of the things that happens in the work that I did, um, so in the early 20th century, if, um, people get hurt a lot. If you think about a machinist running a drill press, if you're running a drill press for 30 years, um, there's a, a, a heavy objects coming down quickly, you might lose a knuckle or a finger, 
every so often. And so if you've been a machinist, this is true for railroad brakemen as well. If you've done that work for 20 or 30 years, you're going to only have, you know, seven or eight fingers, but that's not disqualifying. That's um, actually a qualification. It's a mark of having been in the, in the work for a long time. And so there's a pro and there's, there's, this is deeply gendered as well. There's a sort of, you know, manly men have, have, have worked a long time and they wear their work experience on their bodies and it's not disqualifying. Um, in a way, it's a kind of like you tell war stories and the scars are a thing to brag about. Um, and that's not to minimize the cost, but that's part of the culture, um, especially for um, the skilled trades in the early 20th century. And I just want to stress skill is a political category. It's not a normative judgment on my part. It's a normative judgment by the labor movement. But um, then very, very rapidly in the space of less than a decade, that sort of I'm a manly man who's lost some fingers I've put in my time kind of war story, that rapidly becomes a liability from the employer perspective and becomes a reason to bounce people out of work. And so I didn't get into it this way in my book, but I think you could tell this as a story about two contending visions of a disability frame um, in response to workers' comp. And, and very, very quickly, I think generalizing a little bit, I think we could think about this as a point of contact across all of our papers, because I think there's an issue, I wrote it down when Karen was talking, but I wrote down too much, I can't find it. I think there's an issue of like, who, who does the framing to whom, in response to what in their context and for what purpose. And I think like that's a way to sort of come at, to put some of the, the apparent differences in our research. I think there's actually behind that is a great deal of, of commonality because I think that's kind of one of the organizing questions. And so that, that's how I, would, how I would answer that. And it's a very generative question. Thank you for that. Thank you. Another great question. This is Rabia. I'm coming after Nate because in some ways we have similarities with uh, this is awful things happening to people <laughs> that is being imposed upon them. One of the difficulties, I, I mean, I must confess in writing this book is trying to figure out how to deal with this consciousness and identity issue of disability, given that no one in my book actually self-identifies as someone who is mentally disabled. So it is not like what we see now where advocates will self-consciously um, sort of challenge voting laws and restrictions um, as disabled people. The folks in my book are voting despite, right, sort of the challenges against them, but they're not doing it as an assertion, right, of their mental incompetency. They believe that this is not a category um, that is responsive to them. So when it comes to this idea of claims making or consciousness from, from below, um, so one of the things that we, we borrow a lot and has been done a lot with uh, histories of subordinated groups that's hard to see. And I think Nate and I have both been sort of dealing with that. Um, on the other hand though, in terms of state and political consciousness of uh, disability, that's all over the place, right? And I think law is a really crucial place to see that happen um, in which um, doling out resources, thinking about space, uh, sort of all sorts of things have this disability aspect to it. And one of the things that I am so gratified to having Karen as a disability scholar now <laughs> is that she's so good at showing how the state is puzzling through sort of these aspects, right? Um, and showing like actual people, right? Sort of these bureaucrats that are putting in um, sort of these huge weighty issues and conversation. I'll chime in briefly. Um, Emily, thank you for the question and, and so great that you're here. And I actually, I hope that Leah Samples will also jump in on this question because I think that your um, work is, is really on point. You'll have to briefly explain to folks um, what your dissertation is about, but I think it's, it's central to this question. I mean, I think something that I'm really puzzling through in my work on disability benefits is a sense that, you know, there's no disability welfare rights movement right there's no um you know in this in this context i think there's a sense that again as the legal aid lawyers saw it, that disability is something that a person might claim because they're in an economically precarious 
position. And so it would be something that they understand is going to unlock certain resources from the state, but it's not necessarily something that they would choose to broadcast as an affirmative sort of social identity. Um, and now I think at the same time, you know, in other contexts, people absolutely are doing that, but I don't think that's my actors in this particular piece that I'm writing about. And so an interesting puzzle um, is why that is. Um, I think this goes to, a, you know, a tension that we've all been alluding to, which is, some laws um, instantiating a social model of disability and other laws instantiating a medicalized model. And so the actors that I'm talking about are very much kind of caught in the medicalized model with all that sort of um, goes with that, like including the sort of um, the gatekeeping, right? The idea that you don't get to claim this, we will decide for you if you get it or not. Leah, do you want to chime in on this? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, as Karen mentioned, I also look um, at disability benefits and how they're actualized. And I look at um, blind people in the New Deal era. So I think the disability group that I look at is a little bit different and unique in that uh, there's a strong, a lot of the actors that I'm working with, there's a strong um, identity of being blind and there's also um, a strong community. And so for a lot of the blind people that I look at, they work together in communities to, to actualize their benefits. And so, I look at um, disability uh, blind benefits in the New Deal, and I have a lot of actors who uh, frequently are writing to President Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, um, using their voice and saying, we need more benefits um, as a collective. So I think that it really is specific to uh, the disability group that we're talking with. And I think that this can push us um, to, to look at how different types of disabilities organized um, and how important it is that we that we are specific about um, the specific types of disabilities that we're talking about because many of them had really different experiences and actualizing benefits and sort of how they use their identity um, to advocate. It looks like we have about a minute left so uh, we have I'm going to have one last question um, for Professor um, Belt. And so the question is, do you see further connections in your work between place, space, and mental competency? Uh, so to take this further, how does this narrative map onto histories which trace geographic access to vote? So how would you center or decenter spaces like prisons, men mental institutions, and hospitals? Great. Um, so I think one of the, and hi, Rebecca, thank you for that question. Um, one of the key ways that we have clustered people together is uh, where we have decided that they need to be managed because they are seen as um, having some def deficit for some reason, right? Like sort of there's a mass, like there's a long story of mass institutionalization. Um, so I just wrote a piece, Mass Institutionalization and Civil Death that thinks about this, um, where we have say prisons and asylums and poorhouses, all of these places in which people are put to be treated um, sometimes to be punished too, when it comes to the carceral state. Um, so on the one hand, these are sites of a lot of economic work, right? So this means jobs, this means recognition for the places that have them, but it also potentially means blocks of voters um, that are concentrated together, that have something in common, that mainstream society does not want to recognize as a valid political interest to be voting for. Um, so we see a long history of folks who have been disenfranchised because they're in sort of these concentrated um, places because they are deemed to be a voting block that is dangerous as opposed to one that is generative. Um, and I think it also goes to like this idea that there are groups of people that are supposed to be clients of the state as opposed to citizens of the state. They are supposed to receive things and we could judge them to see whether or not they should receive them, they're supplicants. Um, but they are not supposed to act in their own interests. They are not supposed to receive resources or ask for more resources because they um, should be grateful for what they get. Um, and they are seen as disconnected from 
other sort of uh, advocacy groups or advocacy areas um, that don't work under those types of restrictions. But I guess to, as we close, to sort of bring it back to um, uh, sort of Re Representative Presley's um, sort of keynote, right, that we don't work in these circumscribed boxes, and then also that we want to have the people that are closest to the problem being the ones in power, we totally need to reverse this idea of the people that have been subject to the state should be the ones that should be determining where it goes in the future. Thank you, and thanks to all of our panelists for a really fruitful and um, great discussion. We have about a 30 minute break from 2.30 to three o'clock, and then please come back at 3 p.m. for our second panel, The Cost Narrative. Thank you so much, Lily. And thank you, for, so what a, what a great panel. This is such an interesting conversation and, and we're so excited uh, to, to, you know, to have heard all that and, and, and for our next panel. Just hopping in right now to, this is Matthew again, uh, to bring in Ashlyn to announce our final CLE code for the first panel. Hi again, um, if you are seeking CLE credit for today's event, please know um, the CLE passwords will be announced twice per hour. Again, please write down these passwords and enter them on your digital evaluation form um, once the event is over. I sent that link about 20 minutes ago, um, but I can send it again. The evaluation form is mandatory to receive CLE credits. Um, so uh, these passwords will tell us how long you have attended. The last and final password for this panel is BIRD, B-I-R-D, BIRD. Thank you so much, Ashlyn, and we will see everyone again in a half hour. <laughs>